Inside Villa Echo's safe room, Miles and Beckett Fowl were experiencing a shared emotion, that emotion being confusion. Confusion was nothing new to either boy, but this was the first occasion on which they had felt it simultaneously. To explain, as the twins were so dissimilar in everything except for physiognomy, it was not unusual for the actions of the one to confound the mind of the other. Miles had lost count of how many times Beckett's attempted conversations with wildlife had bewildered his logical brain, and Beckett, for his part, was flummoxed on an hourly basis by his brother's scientific lectures. So, generally, one twin was lucid while the other was confused, but on this occasion, they were mystified as a unit. What's happening, Miles? asked Beckett. Miles did not answer the question, reluctant to admit that he couldn't quite fathom what exactly was going on. Just a moment, brother, she, he said. I'm processing. Miles was indeed processing, almost as quickly as the safe room's processors were processing. Nani's gel incarnation may have been a puddle on the floor, but the AI itself was safe inside Villa Echo's protected systems and was now replaying footage from a network of cameras slung underneath a weather balloon. These cameras were outside the Faraday cage and unfortunately had succumbed to the EMP, but before they had, they managed to transmit the video to the foul server. Nani had zeroed in on two points of interest. First, the AI located a dissipating bullet vapor trace and followed it back to the mainland to find that there was a camouflage sniper there, a hairsuit chap and an antique Russian Mosin Nagat rifle, which would have been over 80 years old if Nani was correct. There is the culprit, she said from a wall speaker. A sneaky sniper near the harbor. This was not the source of Miles' confusion, as the sonic boom had had to come from somewhere, and after all, the Fowl family had many enemies from the bad old days. The fact that one enemy would employ an antique weapon could relate back to some decades old vendetta having to do with any number of the twins' ancestors, most probably Artemis Sr., who had once attempted to muscle in on the Russian Mafia's Murmansk market. This sniper might simply be on a revenge mission, and what better way to hurt the father than to target the sons? The second point of interest, and the cause of Miles' bewilderment, was another, much smaller figure that had been captured by one camera. The tiny creature had appeared out of thin air, pedaled to keep herself to loft, and then plummeted into the seaweed silo. Beckett's confusion was more general in nature, but he did have one question as the brothers reviewed the balloon footage. A pedaling fairy, he said, but where's her bicycle? Miles was not inclined to answer, but was inclined to disagree. There's no bicycle, brother mine, he snapped. But I do not happen to believe in fairies or wizards or demigods or vampires. This is either photo manipulation or interference from a satellite system. He rewound the footage and froze the figure in the sky, stepping closer for a decent squint. Magnify, he told his spectacles, which Miles had augmented with various lenses pillaged from his big brother's sealed laboratory. Artemis had set a 22-digit security code on his door that he did not realize Miles had suggested to him subliminally by whispering into his ear every night for a week as he slept. To add further insult, the numbers Miles had chosen could be decoded using a simple letter-to-number cipher to spell out the Latin phrase Stultus Diana Emphorsium, which translated to Diana is stupid, Diana being the Roman version of the Greek goddess Artemis for whom Artemis had been named. It was a very complicated and time-consuming prank which, in Miles' opinion, was the best kind. Yes, said Beckett, magnify. And the blonde twin accomplished his magnification simply by taking a step closer to the screen, which in truth was both more efficient and cost effective. Miles studied the suspended creature. It seemed clear that there was, at the very least, a possibility it was not human. Beckett jabbed the wall screen with his finger, daubing it with whatever gunk was coating his hand at the time. Marius, there's a ferry on an invisible helibike. I'm one million percent sure. There is no such animal as a helibike, and you can't have a million percent back, said Miles absently. Anyway, how can you be so sure? Remember Artemis' stories? asked Beckett. He told us all about the fairies. This was true. Their older brother had often tucked in the twins with stories of the fairy people who lived deep in the earth. The tale always ended with the same lines. The fairies dig deep and they endure, but if they ever need to breathe fresh air or gaze upon the moon, they know that we will keep their secrets, for the fowls have ever been friends to the people. Fowl and fairy, fairy and fowl, as it is now and will ever be. 
Those are stories, said Miles. How can you be certain there's a drop of truth to them? I just am, said Beckett, which was an often employed phrase guaranteed to drive Miles in paroxysms of indignant rage. You just are? You just are? He squeaked. That's not a valid argument. Your voice is squeaky, Beckett pointed out. Like a little piggy. That's because I am enraged, said Miles. I'm enraged because you're presenting your opinion as fact, brother. How is one supposed to unravel this mystery when you insist on babbling inanities? Beckett reached into the pocket of his cargo shorts and pulled out a piece of gummy candy. Here, he said, wiggling the worm at Miles as though it were alive. This gummy is red, and you need the red because your face is too white. My face is white because my fight or flight response has been activated, said Miles, glad to have something he was in a position to explain. Red blood cells have been shunted to my limbs in case I need to either do battle or flee. That is so interesting, said Beckett, winking at his brother to nail home the sarcasm. So the last thing I shall do is eat a gummy worm, declared Miles. One of us has to be a grown-up 11-year-old, and that one will be me, as usual. So whatever I do in the immediate future, gummy eating will not be a part of it. Do you understand me, brother? By which time, Miles had actually popped the worm in his mouth and was sucking it noisily. He had always had been a sucker when it came to gummy candy. In this case, he was a sucker for the gummy he was sucking. Becca gave him a few seconds to unwind and then asked, Better? Yes, admitted Miles. Much better. For, although he was a certified genius, Miles was also anxious by nature and tended to stress over the least little thing. Beckett smiled. Good, because a squeaky genius is a stupid genius. I dreamed that one time. That is a crude but accurate statement, Beck, said Miles. When a person's vocal register rises more than an octave, it's usually the result of panic, and panic leads to a certain rashness of behavior untypical of that individual. But Miles was more or less talking to himself at this point, because Beckett had wandered away, as he often did during his twin's lectures, and was peering through the safe room's panoramic periscope's eyepiece. That's nice, Miles, but you'd better stop explaining things I don't care about. And why is that? asked Miles a little crossly. Because, said Beckett, the helicopter. I know, Beck, said Miles, softening. Helicopter. It was true that Beckett didn't seem to either know or care about very many things, but there were certain subjects he was most informed about. Insects being one of those subjects. Trumpets was another. And also, helicopters. Beckett loved helicopters. In times of stress, he sometimes mentioned favorite items, but there was little significance to his helicopter references unless he added the model number. Helicopter, insisted Beckett, making room for his brother at the mechanical periscope. Army Mountain Augusta Westland AW-139. Time to pay attention, thought Miles. Miles propped his spectacles on his forehead and studied the periscope view briefly for visual confirmation that there was, in fact, a helicopter cresting the mainland ridge. The chopper bore Irish Army markings and therefore would not need warrants to land on the island, if that were the Army's intention. And I cannot and will not fight on any Irish Army helicopter, Miles thought, even though it seemed inevitable that the Army was about to place the twins in some form of custody. For most people, this knowledge would be a great source of comfort, but historically, incarceration did not end well for members of the Fowl family, and so Father had always advised Miles to take certain precautions should arrest or even protective custody seem inevitable. Give yourself a way out, son, Artemis Sr. had said. You're a twin, remember? Miles always took what his father said seriously, and so he regularly updated his Ways Out of Incarceration folder. This calls for a classic, he thought, then said to his brother. Beck, I need to tell you something. Is it story time? Asked Beckett brightly. Yes, said Miles. That's precisely it. Story time. Is it one of Artemis's, the Arctic Incident or the Eternity Code? Miles shook his head. No, brother, this is a very important story, so you will need to concentrate. Can you achieve a high level of focus? Beckett was dubious, for Miles often declared things to be important when he himself regarded them as peripheral at best. For example, some of the many things Miles considered important. Science, inventing, literature, the world economy. And things Beckett considered hugely important, if not vital. Gloop, talking to animals, 
peanut butter, expelling wind however necessary before bed. Rarely did these lists overlap. Is it this important to me or just Big Brainy Miles? Beckett asked with considerable suspicion. This was a most exciting day and it would be just like Miles to ruin it with common sense. Both of us, I promise. Wrist bump promise? asked Beckett. Wrist bump promise, said Miles, holding up the heel of his hand. They bumped and Beckett, satisfied that a wrist bump promise could never be broken, plunked himself down on the giant beanbag. Before I tell you the story, said Miles, we must become human transports for some very special passengers. What passengers? asked Beckett. They must be teeny tiny if we're going to be the transports. They are teeny tiny, said Miles, not entirely comfortable using such a subjective unit of measurement as teeny tiny, but Beckett had to be kept calm. He opened the plexiglass door on top of the insect hotel and scooped out a handful of tiny jumping creatures. I would even go so far as to say teeny weeny. I thought we weren't supposed to touch these guys, said Beckett. We're not, said Miles, dividing the insects between them. Except in an emergency, and this is most definitely an emergency. It took a mere two minutes for Miles to relate his story, which was, in fact, an escape plan, and an additional six minutes for him to repeat it three times so Beckett could absorb all the particulars. Once Beckett had repeated the details back to him, Miles persuaded his twin to don some clothing, namely a white t-shirt printed with the word, uh-oh, a phrase often employed both by Beckett himself upon breaking something valuable, and also by people who knew Beckett when they saw him approach. Miles even had time to disable the villa's more aggressive defenses, which might decide to blow the helicopter out of the sky with some surface-to-air missiles before the knock came at the door. Here it comes the cavalry, thought Miles. In this rare instance, Miles Fowles was incorrect. The woman at the door would never be mistaken for an officer of the cavalry. She was, in fact, a nun. It's a nun, said Beckett, checking the intercom camera. Miles confirmed this with a glance at the screen. It was indeed a nun who appeared to have been winched down in a basket from the hovering helicopter. If we do nothing, she might go away, thought Miles. After all, perhaps this person doesn't even know we're here. Miles should have voiced this thought instead of thinking it, for quick as a flash, Beckett pressed the talk button and said, Hi, Mysterious Nun. This is Miles Fowl speaking, one of the Fowl twins. My brother Beckett is here too, and we're home alone. We'll be with you in a minute. We're down in the safe room because of the sonic boom. I'm so glad the EMP didn't kill your helicopter. Beckett's statement contained basically every scrap of information that Miles had wanted to be kept secret. Gracias, said the unexpected nun. I shall await your arrival. Beckett was hopping with excitement. Miles, it's a nun with a helicopter. You'd hardly ever see it. This is the start of our first real adventure. It has to be. I can feel it in my elbows. Beckon often felt things in his elbows, which he claimed were psychic. He sometimes pointed them at cookie jars to see if there were cookies inside, which Miles had never considered much of a challenge, as one of Nani's robot arms filed the kitchen containers as soon as their smart sensors informed the network they were empty. Beck, with no disrespect to your extrasensory elbows, said Miles, why don't we try to stay calm and stick to the plan? If we can stay, we stay, but if we go, remember the story. Beckett tapped his forehead. It's all in here, brother. Angry hamster in the dimension of fire. No, Beck, snapped Miles. Not that story. Ha, huh, said Beckett. You snapped at me. I win. Miles counted up to 97 in prime numbers to calm himself. One of Beckett's pleasures in life was teasing his brother until he snapped. It was unfair, really, as it was very difficult to tell the difference between a Beckett who genuinely didn't know something and a Beckett who was pretending not to know something. Ha ha, said Miles without a shred of humor. You got me, you're the big comedian and I'm just Miles the dunce, but in my defense I am trying to keep us alive and out of an army cell. Beckett relented and hugged his brother. Okay Miles, I'll lay off this time, because you have no sense of humor when you're stressed. Let's go upstairs and you can lecture this nun. Miles had to admit that sounded wonderful. A new person to lecture. As eager as Miles Fowl was to debate, argue with, and deliver a monologue to the mysterious nun, he was determined to take his time reaching the front door. 
It is always a good idea to keep potential animal enemies waiting, he knew, and they were more likely to expose their real selves if they become impatient. Beckett was not aware of this tactic, and so Miles had to literally hold him back by hanging onto his belt loops. And thus, Beckett dragged his brother along in his wake as a mule might drag a cart. They passed through the reinforced steel door and climbed the narrow stairwell of polished concrete to the main living area, an open plan quadrilateral marked on three sides with glass walls that were threaded with a conductive mesh, which served both to maintain the integrity of the Faraday cage and reinforce the windows. The reclaimed wooden floors were strewn with rugs, the placement of which might seem random to the untrained eye, but they were actually carefully laid out in accordance with the Ba Ji school of Feng Shui. The space was dominated by a driftwood table and a rough stone fireplace that ran on recycled pellets. But the main feature of the villa was the panoramic view of Dublin Bay that it afforded the residents. Miles could remember visiting the island with his father before construction of the villa began. Criminal masterminds are always drawn to islands, Artemis Fowl Sr. had said. All the greats have them. Colonel Hootenkamp had Flint Island. Hans Harkonnut had Spider Island, which was more of a glacier, I suppose. Ishimayishi, the malignant inventor, had an island in the Japanese archipelago. And now we have Dalky Island. And Miles had asked, Are we criminal masterminds, father? His father did not answer for half a minute, and Miles got the feeling that he was choosing his words carefully. No, son, he said eventually, but sometimes you have to fight fire with fire. This, Miles knew, was a metaphor, and as a scientist, he felt obligated to dissect it. Fire being an agalus of crime, he said. So, if I take your meaning correctly, you are saying that on occasion, the only way to defeat a criminal is to turn his own methods against him. Artemis Sr. had laughed and tousled his son's hair. I'm just thinking out loud, son. The fowls are out of that game. Now why don't we go and forget I ever mentioned criminal masterminds and just enjoy the view? A view that was utterly ignored by Miles now, as he attempted to slow his energetic brother's trip to their front door. He felt confident that once they reached the door, he'd be able to argue legal precedent through the intercom for hours with the waiting nun until the cows came home. Or at least until he could fill his parents in on the situation. The problem would be how to contain Beckett. As it happened, this problem never materialized. When they reached the front door, it was already open. The nun had stepped from the rescue basket and was closing her fingers over a hockey puck sized device strapped to her palm. There you are, chicos, said the nun. The door simply opened of its own accord. Incredible, no? Incredible indeed, thought Miles. This nun may not be virtuous as her clothing suggests. The woman at Villa Echo's front door was indeed a nun, but her habit was a little more stylish than one would usually associate with the various religious orders. She was dressed in a simple black linen smock that could have indicated that she liked Star Wars films or had just discovered an amazing young designer. The smock was cinched with a wide satin belt that nodded toward ancient Japanese culture. Her hair was too golden to be natural and was arranged in that bouffant style known in saloons as 1980s news anchor, on which, top of which perched a veil of black polyester secured with a jeweled hat pin. Buenas tardes, chicos, she said. I am Sister Germana Gonzalez Ramos de Zarate de Balbo. Becca didn't hear anything after the first name. Geronimo! He cried enthusiastically, throwing up his arms. No, niño, said the nun patiently. Geronimo, not Geronimo. Beckett altered his cry appropriately. Geronimo! And segued into a couple of blunt questions. Sister, why are you red and why do you smell funny? Gerana smiled indulgently. These were the questions that most people wished to ask but would not. You see, Chico, my skin has a slight tinge because of my order, the Sisters of the Rose. We stain our flesh red with the non-toxic aniline dye solution to demonstrate our devotion to Mary, the rose without thorns. And the odor is from the dye, it's all in the almonds, no? It is like the almonds, yes, said Beckett. I love it. Can I stain my skin too, Miles? No, brother, said Miles, smiling. Not until you were 18. Miles was less smiley in his attitude toward the nun. Is this a dronema? he said. It would seem that you have broken into our home. Geronima joined her hands as though she might pray. I am a no 
on, I would never do this. As I think I said, the door was open. Perhaps your EMP affected the locks, no? Miles was glad the rose-colored nun had lied. At least he knew where they stood now. You are, at the very least, trespassing on private property, he countered. Geronimo waved his point away as though it were a pesky mosquito. I do not answer to your country's estupido lies. I see, said Miles. You obey a higher power, I suppose. Si, absolutamente, if you like. A higher power in the helicopter, said Beckett. Geronimo smiled tightly. Eh, not exactly, Nino. Let us simply say that I am not bound by the rules of your government. That's very nice, said Miles. But we are not donating today. Can you please call again when our parents are home? But I am not here for donations, Miles Fowl, said Geronimo. I am here to rescue you. Miles feigned surprise. Rescue us, you say, sister, but we are in the safest facility on Earth. In fact, I am disobeying my parents' instructions by speaking with you. So if you don't mind... He attempted to close the aforementioned door, but was thwarted by the nun's left knee-high leather boot, which she had jammed between door and frame. But I do, my niño, she said, pushing the door open. You are unsupervised miners under attack from an unknown assailant. It's my duty to escort you to a place of safety. I'd like to be escorted in a helicopter, Miles, said Beckett. Can we go? Can we? Please? See, si, Miles, said Geronima. Can we go? Please make your brother happy. Miles raised a stiff finger and cried, Not so fast! It was undeniable that this was a touch melodramatic, but Miles felt justified in indulging his weakness, as there was a repelling nun at the front door. How would you know we are under attack, Sister Geronima? My organization has eyes everywhere, said Geronima with what Miles would come to know as her customary vagueness. That sounds suspiciously illegal, sister, said Miles, thinking he could stall her for several minutes while he winked out more information about this mysterious organization they were supposed to simply hand themselves over to. That sounds as though you are infringing on my rights, which is unusual for a woman of the cloth. Geronima crossed her arms. I am unusual for a moment of the cloth. Also, I am a trauma nurse, and I once threw knives in the circle. That is to say, a circus. But I am not important now. You are important, and it is true that's what you say about you, Chico. You are the smart one. And I am the one who can climb, said Beckett, blowing his brother's stalling plan to smithereens by vaulting into the helicopter's rescue basket and scrambling up the winch cable faster than a maquet scaling a fruit tree. And he is the one who can climb, said Sister Geronima. And most quickly, too. She stepped back and opened the basket's gate. Shall we follow, Chico? Miles had little choice in the matter now that Beckett had taken the lead. I suppose we should, he said, a bit miffed that his fact-finding mission had been cut short. But only if you desist in the fake endearments. Chico, indeed. I am eleven years old now and hardly a child. Very well, Miles Fowl, said Sister Geronima. From now on, you shall be tried as an adult. The gate was already closed behind Miles when this comment registered. Tried? I am to be tried? Geronima fake laughed. Oh, forgive me, that was, uh, how do you say, a slip of the tongue. I meant, of course, you were to say treated. You shall be treated as an adult. Hmm, said Miles, unconvinced. There was some form of trial ahead, he felt sure of it. Geronima made a circling motion with her index finger, and the winch was activated. As the basket rose into the night sky, Miles glanced down, appreciating the aerial view of Via Echo, which, when seen from above, formed the shape of an uppercase F. F for foul. Still a little of the criminal mastermind in you, eh, Papa? He thought, and wondered how much of that particular characteristic there was in himself. However much there needs to be in order to keep Beckett safe, he decided. With a tap to the temple of his spectacles, Miles activated the infrared filter in his lenses and noticed that, across the bay, the sniper was packing up his gear. We were not the target, he realized now. A sniper with even one functioning eyeball could have easily picked us off at the beach. So what were you after, Mr. Beardy Man? He committed this puzzle to his subconscious to be worked on in the background while he dealt with Sister Geronima and the other mysterious player in their drama. 
a player who was now emerging from the seaweed silo. Not that anyone but Miles would notice, for the creature, whatever it proved to be exactly, was more or less invisible. Invisible, thought the foul twin. How mysterious. And as his father often said, a mystery is simply an advanced puzzle. Thunder was once a mystery. A wise man learns from the unknown by making it known. And the wise boy, father, thought Miles now. He magnified his view of the silo creature and saw that a single body part was visible even without the infrared. Its right ear, which was pointed. Somewhere in Miles' brain, a light bulb flashed. A pointed ear! And then the pointy-eared creature began to pedal, and it lifted off after the ascending rescue basket. Beck was right, thought Miles, glancing upward at his brother, who was already boarding the helicopter. It was indeed a ferry on an invisible bicycle. Darvit, he blurted, shocked that Artemis' stories had been, in fact, historical rather than fictional. Sister Geronima mistook the blurt for a sneeze. Bless you, Chico, she said. The night air is cool. Miles did not bother to correct her, because an explanation would be difficult, considering that the word Darvit was a fairy swear word, according to Artemis' fairy tales. Miles silently vowed not to use it again, at least not until he knew what it meant exactly. Lord Teddy Bleedum Dry was surprised to find his mood brightening somewhat. This would have been a bombshell to anyone who knew him, as the Duke was notorious for throwing royal tantrums when things did not go his way. He had an emotional hair trigger since childhood when he would heave his toys from the stroller if he refused to treat. At family gatherings, his father often embarrassed him with the story of how five-year-old Teddy had hurled his wooden horse over the St. George Cliffs when the nanny served him lukewarm lemonade, and how Teddy had been so antisocial that it had become necessary to send him to Charterhouse boarding school at age five instead of seven, which was more traditional among those of the upper class. Now, one and a half centuries later, the Duke's general mood had not improved much, though he tended to take out his frustrations on other people's property rather than his own, and let his irritation fester in his stomach acid. Good form at all times. And so, Lord Teddy was surprised to find himself whistling as he packed his gear. Whistling, Teddy, old boy. Surely you ought to be sinking into your usual vengeful funk. But no, he was virgin on the exuberant. And why would that be? It would be, Teddy old fellow, because there was something afoot here. I take a single shot and suddenly an army is swooping in for an extraction. The Fowls were an important family, but not that important. The island was obviously under the surveillance of some agency or other. This confirmed my growing certainty that Brother Coleman's lead was sound. Now, Teddy had a choice. He could either continue to stake out the island and wait for another troll, or he could follow the Fowl children and find the one he had wrapped earlier. Lord Bleedham Dry knew that, logically, he should maintain his surveillance on the soon-to-be unguarded Dalky Island, but his instinct said, follow the fowls. The Duke trusted his instinct. It kept him alive this long. After all, it would be child's play to follow the troll, for each Miyishi CV round was radioactively coded, and Teddy had programmed the individual codes into his marvelous Miyishi Dry wristwatch, which had over a thousand functions, including geopin news alerts and actually telling the time. The Dry series was THE gold standard in criminal appliances. It included watches, exercise machines, a gorgeous porcelain handgun, a line of lightweight bulletproof apparel, a light aircraft, and a range of communication devices. Each item was embossed with a copy of the famous Mondaglini line portrait of the Duke from 1915. In return for his sponsorship, Teddy had a yearly credit of 5 million US dollars with the company, and a 50% discount on anything above that amount. The slogan for the dry range was, Stay dry in any situation with Maishi. It had been a most successful arrangement for both parties. And, in truth, Lord Teddy would have long since declared bankruptcy without the Maishi Corp sponsorship deal. For his part, Ishi Maishi had the seal of approval from one of the most respected criminal masterminds slash mod scientists in the community, which shifted enough units to easily pay the Duke's tab. Good old Maishi, thought Lord Teddy now, and his marvelous gadgets. The Duke and Ishimaishi had been associates as man and boy, or more accurately, since Maishi was a boy who had lied about his age to join the Japanese army, and Teddy Bleedham Dry was a British army officer. The Duke had discovered young Maishi breaking out of a prison shed in Burma, defending himself with a shotgun the lad had cobbled together from the frame and springs of his cot. 
Teddy recognized genius when he saw it, and instead of turning the boy in, he had arranged for him to study engineering in Cambridge. The rest, as I say, was history, albeit a secret one. By Teddy's reckoning, Mayashi had repaid his debt a hundred times over. Make that a hundred and one, Teddy thought, for one of the Duke's sponsorship perks was a hunter tracker system that could be bounced off several private satellites. And so, wherever in a several hundred mile radius that troll went, Teddy could easily follow. The fowls will never hear me coming, he thought, and they will never hear the bullets that kill them. Lazuli Heights could not figure out the black-haired fowl boy. He just sat there smiling at her as though she were absolutely visible to him. But that could not be, for the other occupants of the chopper were completely ignoring her. The second boy was making bird noises at passing seagulls, while the woman in black plied the bespectacled kid with questions that he blithely ignored, maintaining both his eye contact with Lazuli and a broad grin. That child radiates smugness, Lazuli thought. I don't like him already. The first opportunity I shall retrieve the troll and get far away from these people. In truth, she was beginning to regret her decision to board the helicopter in the first place. Perhaps she should have simply waited for LEP Recon to show up. But the decision was made now, and there was no point regretting it. Plus, her pedaling mechanism had been injured by the fall and she had barely managed to make it to the helicopter. Her wings had folded themselves into their rig as a sign that there would be no more flying until her suit regenerated. So now she needed to concentrate on her next step. As her angel had told her, there is no future in the past. Which meant that obsessively second-guessing your own decisions was a waste of time. At least, that's what she took it to mean. And so, Lazuli had, minutes before, dragged herself from the seaweed, feeling like she had endured a severe beating due to the effects of the filibuster, and pedaled her way to the chopper's altitude. The ad hoc plan had been to clamp herself onto the skids, but they were already armed soldiers occupying those spots, so Lazuli had no choice but to slip between the troops, careful not to nudge against the automatic weapons, for it was a universal truth that warriors of any species do not like their guns being touched. She crawled under the jump seat, hoping the filaments did not drop off and expose her. Although it felt like the chromomorphic camouflage strands were embedded in the fabric of her jumpsuit, not to mention patches of her blue skin when would never wash off, which was currently a good thing. Lazuli hunkered under there in the shadows trying to take stock. Learn as much as you can, specialist. More advice from her angel. A friend once told me that gold is power, but he was wrong for once. Information is power. Information. Lazuli had precious little of that currency. But after more than a minute, she hadn't picked up much more, aside from the fact that the speckled boy was still looking right at her. If he's looking, why isn't he telling? Lazuli sincerely wished she could have done a little homework on this family before embarking on her exercise, but the foul file was locked up tighter than a dwarf's wallet. The strange boy's smile is not a friendly one, she realized. It's the smile of a boy who has a secret. As for the second child, he was apparently a simpleton who cawed and screeched down at seagulls as the chopper whooped overhead. Perhaps three minutes later, Lazuli had picked up two potentially useful nuggets. One, they were headed southeast toward mainland Europe. And two, as a magic-free zone herself, Lazuli had been forced to study hard just to barely pass the Gift of Tongues exam, and so she realized that the human child squealing at seagulls was not as simple as she had assumed he was. Her train of thought was derailed by this bespeckled boy, who clearly cleared his throat noisily. Are you ill, Chico? The nun asked, to which he replied, I am perfectly fine, Sister Geronima, he said. There is no need to shout into my right ear. It's here beside you, perfectly visible. It took Lazuli a moment to realize that his comments were aimed at her and not at the nun. When the white light bulb went on, she hurriedly clamped a hand over her right ear. Damn it! she swore internally, which defeated the venting purpose of swearing. Does this mean I owe the human boy a favor?